So what I am willing to believe is that these two are useful idiots. Right. They are just pawns in a very large, very elaborate system. Someone tweeted that a senator asked a congressional hearing whether there should be a pause in crypto. In today's video, Mark Yusko, the founder, CEO and CIO of Morgan Creek Capital Management, share his thoughts about the recent mass panic triggers $1 trillion crypto price crash and short squeeze warning, as FTX's FTT goes into freefall, dragging down other cryptos. Resulting in an aggressive sell-off in FTX's token, FTT, as well as Solana, which is one of the largest holdings of FTX's principal trading firm Alameda Research. This continues to unnerve traders in a space so driven by sentiment. Before listening to him, please ensure to smash the like button and subscribe to the channel. The, the extent of the fraud is, is clear. It is profound. You know, the, the guy who cleaned up the Enron mess, who has been charged with cleaning up this mess, publicly stated that this is a worse disaster and debacle than Enron. And Enron was pretty bad. And, and people went to jail. Uh, you know, somebody actually, you know, died in jail. Um, so uh, it, it's an interesting dynamic. And, you know, we have a story in the New York Times saying that he's just a misunderstood philanthropist. Yeah. Are you kidding me? I mean, seriously, are, are you kidding me? And then the New York Times again does this, this puff piece. And I'll give Andrew Ross Sorkin a little bit, a tiny, tiny little bit of credit or maybe asking one or two almost hard questions, but then he didn't press. He didn't actually make Sam answer the question. You know, I, it's funny, I, I took media training one time, Michelle, and I, I went in with the guy and I sat down and, and you know, it was very nice. He said, okay, I'm gonna ask you a question. So he asked me a question and I started to answer. He says, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? I'm, I'm answering the question. He says, Mark, you never answer the question. You reflect <laughs> and redirect and talk about what you wanna talk about. I'm wow. like, I am a dutiful firstborn, Michelle. I will always answer the question. So Sam well, deflected yeah. and redirected and nobody pressed him on it. And that's just crazy. The CEO of Pershing Square Capital, American billionaire investor and hedge fund manager, coming out and saying, unsolicited, call me crazy, but I think SPF is telling the truth. And again, media fawning over him. Firstly, are you pretty sure that he did commit fraud from what you've seen? What is your take on it? Uh, look, I mean, it, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm 100% convinced and I actually have evidence of it, given I'm a large investor in, in one of the companies that he defrauded and uh, directly. Um, so, you know, I look, I anyone who just watched that video would say it's it's literally like watching a training tape for how to spot a liar, right? <laughs> Liars lie. You know, his his lack of, of eye contact. Uh, I mean, at one point he's jittering so much. Now, maybe he, he didn't have enough of his ADD medicine, maybe. But I, I mean, he he's clearly lying. You know, anyone who studies, I mean, look, I, I spent my life interviewing people, right? I said I had the best job in the world for 30 years. I got paid to talk to the smartest people in the world and, and allocate capital to them. And so I've interviewed thousands and thousands of people and actually took training from FBI types and others on on how to read people and how to tell when they're telling the truth or telling a lie. And Sam's, Sam's a liar and he's, he's always been a liar. Now, he's also been coached clearly very well by legal team, probably the best legal team that money can buy the money that he stole. And he's been told to say a certain number of things. I didn't knowingly commit fraud. It's like saying manslaughter has a lower sentence than premeditated murder. So if I can just get off on the lower, I, I didn't know it was fraud. I, I just made yeah. a mistake. I did, I did, you know, it was a mislabeled bank account. Nonsense, nonsense. This is, now I will say, Michelle, I mean, you and I talked about this uh, a couple weeks ago. It is certainly possible when I watch this guy just now, when I watch him on another video, and look, I've never met the person. I've, I've never met the man. Um, we passed on this deal three times, not, right. not because we had any inside information, but because the valuation never made sense. I mean, 
crazy valuations, multiples of, of when, when FTX going to approached Morgan Creek yes. to invest. Yeah. 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 So, you know, lots of people did invest in three different financing rounds. We, like any other venture capitalist, were approached to to participate. And we, we just said no. And again, no information. We didn't know it was fraud uh, until too late. But but the bottom line, had I ever met him, I'm fairly confident in saying that I, I would have turned and run away. And right. his girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, Caroline, worse. I mean, anyone who's seen the video of her, that person was no way in charge of a $20 billion trading enterprise, which turns out there was no trading enterprise. So what I am willing to believe is that these two are useful idiots. Right. They are just pawns in a very large, very elaborate system that was designed, one, to do money laundering, and there's clear evidence of, of money laundering. Two, uh, that perhaps there was intent, again, uh, this is a supposition, not an accusation, I'm just trying to put the pieces together. It is certainly possible that uh, there was an intent by someone or some ones to have this be an example set so that yeah. regulators could come in and punish the industry. I, I guess earlier today, right before we got on on air, uh, someone tweeted that a senator asked a congressional hearing whether there should be a pause in crypto until mm -hmm. America, until the U.S. regulators can regulate it. Well, like I, I want to get there and definitely unpack this whole useful pawn theory. Um, but before we do that, you, you said that you have evidence of fraud, direct evidence of fraud. So I can't let that go without asking you to elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, look, I, I, I can't talk about it actually, um, because of, of the situation and, and because, you know, the, let's just say, look, everyone knows that we, Morgan Creek, are, are large investors in BlockFi. Everyone knows, and it's a public, I can, I can give you public available information. Mm -hmm. Public information is that uh, BlockFi had made a large loan to Alameda uh, and, and had dealings with FTX. Uh, there are now, now, I, now that's all I can say, that that's the public information. There are lots of suppositions and speculation as to some things that went on in the, the closing days before the, the bankruptcy. Uh, but the reality is that they lied about collateral. They said they had good collateral and, and they didn't. That, that's fraud. Uh, same thing at Three Arrows Capital did when they told lenders that they had good collateral or they had equity, which they didn't. Uh, you can't have a balance sheet with $700 million of assets and $10 billion of liabilities without committing fraud. Golden boy of crypto testifying on Capitol Hill, hobnobbing with politicians and the DC in a circle, having interesting family links to the SEC's Gary Gensler and having meetings between Gensler and SBF highlighted by Congressman Emma. Now, you've taken some of these pieces and put them together and you say that this is an unbelievably elegant takedown of a threat. What exactly do you mean by that? Yeah, so look, again, supposition, no, no, no direct evidence, but but supposition that look, we we we're in the third phase of what I'll call the four phases of digital asset adoption. So it's the famous Gandhi quote, right? First they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. Then you win. And you know, from 2009 to 15, when digital assets were created, and Satoshi Nakamoto created Bitcoin, and then other assets followed, huh, they ignore you. Right? It was like a bunch of nerds and geeks playing with their magic internet money, whatever. Then they laugh at you. So 2016 to 21, ha 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 ha, a bunch of nerds and geeks playing through magic internet money. Oh look, one of these nerds and geeks actually named the Miami Stadium. Ha ha ha. Okay, big deal. Um, 2022, we entered the then they fight you phase. And it started in, in May, right, with the Luna debacle. And literally the moment, the morning after the Luna crash, Janet Yellen was on television saying, in prepared remarks, we need regulation of stable coins. That was prepared, right? That so so something didn't fit that she was so prepared 
in real time to, to make that statement. So perhaps- I mean, on, on, on that, arguably, maybe this was something that they've been looking at, considering there was concern on stable coin, just well, to maybe, push back on, on that particular yeah. point. But okay, it's certainly but possible. On. It's certainly possible. So then, so then you, you have a, a number of, of intimations about, you know, regulation. And at the end of the day, well, and it actually can go back even further to the attacks on the lenders, Celsius, Block 5, Voyager, not the FTX rescues, but the attacks by the states and the SEC. Uh, and the regulation has been used against disruptors for centuries. Right. It's not, you know, in New York City, where you are today, there was something called the red flag law, right? When the horse and buggy was transitioning to the horse's carriage, the horse and buggy manufacturers lobbied, bribed the town council to pass a law that said, lobbying is just a fancy word for corruption. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it sounds nice, but it's the same thing. Um, and they passed a law called the red flag law. So you actually, if you had an automobile, you had to hire someone to walk in front with a red flag. That's where the term yeah. red flag comes from. You don't see anyone in New York City walking in front of cars with a red flag anymore because it was stupid. And we don't see many horse and buggies except in Central Park. So it didn't work. When the airplane came out, the train companies paid a lot of money and lobbying and passed out pamphlets saying that if you got on a plane, you would die. Your body would cave in on itself. When the internet came out, the telephone companies tried to get a law passed through lobbying that would make voice over internet protocol, which you and I are using right now. We're communicating long distance for free over the internet. Phone companies didn't like that. They tried to get a law passed and I will give Al Gore credit. He did not invent the internet, but he did stop that bill with, with some help from friends. And, and so we have an internet that works. And so regulation is a tool used by incumbents and what does blockchain technology do? It replaces trust with truth. Well, who are the arbiters of trust today? Financial institutions, third-party middle people, $7 trillion industry, okay? They would like to not be disrupted by DeFi and digital assets. So it's possible that some group uh, of incumbents might have tried to lobby for regulation to delay, obfuscate, uh, change the course of of the the disruption, perhaps. So that's that's what it it's possible. No experience in lobbying, no experience in in politics, no experience in running uh, an exchange or a trading organization. Um, no no real work experience to speak of. A couple of years um, suddenly becomes an expert in trust law and exchange operations and arbitrage trading uh, and becomes the largest donor to Joe Biden's uh, election campaign, second largest donor last year to the Democratic Party. It's not, so it's not shocking that his mother runs one of the largest PACs, secretive PACs that the Silicon Valley elite used to kind of get around campaign finance laws. That's not surprising to anybody, perhaps. Um, is it a surprise that his father is, you know, went to Yale Law School with a lot of people who are in government and uh, perhaps is a known expert on trust law? Interesting. Uh, advisor to some of the regulatory agencies. Caroline's father, the head of the uh, economics department at MIT, her dad was Gary Gensler's boss. I'm not, again, all of these things just point, they, they paint a really interesting picture. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, I, I have nothing but the utmost respect for the SEC. I think up to this point, and I will say up to this point, uh, and particularly under Jay Clayton's leadership, they were measured, they were consistent, they consistently said, this is not a security. This is not a security. These other things may be securities. I thought they did a great job. They didn't come out and say, oh, everything's a security. They didn't say, oh, we're going to try to ban it like China did. So I actually think the SEC has done a really, really good job up to this point. But there's something funny about two kids with no experience and clearly no 
uh, ability to run this complex business, um, then turning out that half of it, like half of the companies that Alameda invested in Michelle are shell companies owned by SBF 100%. Like that, that just, that's a funny thing. That's mm-hmm. not, when I make an investment out of our venture fund, I don't own any piece of them ever. I, that would be a total conflict. So the right. fact that half of the 400 companies are shell companies that he owns just, just seems odd. And the other thing that's odd, I've been doing venture capital a long time, 35 plus years, got the way here to prove it. Um, never, not once, not once have I ever seen a situation where a person invest hundreds, $250 million in venture funds and then the venture funds put $150 million into that person's company. Maybe it's happened and I just didn't see it, but I've never heard of that ever. So, and, and then the last part of it is the relationship with Ukraine and Zelensky is very odd. Right? Yeah. Money, money going straight from Ukraine and Zelensky to FTX, um, that money vanishing, um, personal loan to SBF, massive donations to Democratic Party. It just, and here's the thing, in the olden days, if you and I got together in a park and I brought my backpack and I put on the bench next to us and then I walked away and you're like, Mark, your backpack. And you looked inside and it was full of cash. The way to trace that. If you actually sent all this stuff through digital assets, people can trace it. So it's not it's not conjecture mm-hmm. that Ukraine sent money to FTX. That's not conjecture. Yeah. It's fact. So it's not a conspiracy theory. It's fact. Now, the part that's missing is how the money got from customer accounts into Sam's pocket to make the political contributions. That's a little bit unclear, but that's where the fraud comes in. And, you know, it's really interesting uh, because it goes to the girlfriend thing. So years ago, there was a situation where there was a a big uh, mutual fund, uh, money market account. And a lot of the endowments used this money market account because it had a little higher rate. And the reason it had a little higher rate was the manager did something called index arbitrage. Yeah. Sounds very similar to what Sam said. Oh, it's just it's just DAX arbitrage. You know, it's price in Japan versus price in London. Index arbitrage. Well, index arbitrage, you go long the index and then you go short the 500 names in the index and you can make a little spread and you can make a little money. Unless you don't get all the trades off one day and you have 495 and you lose a little bit of money. So he, he lost about $30,000. His girlfriend was the back office person. He said, hon, just cover that up for me. I'll trade my way out of it tomorrow. Two years went by, multiple audits of big name firms, $130 million that she covered up. And here's the kicker. Then he broke up with her and she turned him in. So the lesson. Well, don't do hell fraud. has no fury like a woman scorned. Is woman that the scorned, lesson? <laughs> right. But the key is don't break up with the girlfriend if she's covering up your bad stuff. So, you know, clearly Sam broke up with her first and then they were doing bad stuff. But there's another piece of it too, which is in just about every fraud I've ever seen, their family relationships. You know, Bernie's brother-in-law was the accountant transferring the money. You know, he hadn't, I would say, they said Madoff was a hedge fund problem. I'm like, but there was no hedge and there right. was no fund. Right. Right. He hadn't made a trade in 13 years and there actually was no legal entity. He was just transferring money. His brother in law was transferring the money into the personal account. So I think the same thing is true here. You've got an uncle that's involved as, as an accountant. You got the aunt that, you know, some advisor to WEF. I mean, there's all these weird things. And, and look, the truth will come out, I think. Uh, unless the media keeps burying it under the drivel that that they seem to be putting out. But maybe people like you and and some of the internet journalists will will do a better job uh, exposing the truth. 